Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this second week before the season of Lent comes from the second, uh, the twelfth chapter, the second book of Samuel, verses one through to seven a. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, and the poor man had nothing but one little ewe sheep, and he had brought that he had brought, and he brought it up, and it grew with him and with his fa with his children, and it used to eat at his of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to visit him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who does this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Our account begins with God sending Nathan the prophet to speak with King David. David has fallen into the sins of adultery, sleeping with a married woman. David thought he had gotten away with it, and then the woman, Bathsheba, was found to be with child. Here David had two choices, come clean, confess his guilt, cover or cover it up. David chose to cover it up. He called Bathsheba's husband Uriah home from the battlefield. David's hope was that Uriah would quickly sleep with his wife and she could just pretend that the child was Uriah's and not David. Yet, sinful David, while sinful David sought to hide his sins, faithful Uriah sought to lead the holy life. Uriah was a loyal disciplined soldier and refused to go home and be with his wife while his comrades, his fellow soldiers, were away from their families on the battlefield. Thus David could not get Uriah to sleep with his wife and cover up his sin. Therefore David devised a new plan. If Uriah happened to die in battle, Bathsheba would be left a widow. David could then fulfill his kingly duty to look after the widows by marrying her. Then David and Bathsheba could just simply claim that the child was conceived within wedlock and had arrived premature. And in order to achieve this, David had Uriah killed by leaving him alone on the battlefield. And David's plan was essentially successful. Uriah was dead, Bathsheba was his wife, and nobody assumed the baby was conceived out of wedlock. Everyone assumed it was only conceived newly after the marriage. The cover-up had been a success. At least that's what David thought. Because there was one person who David could not hide his sin from, and that was God. And so God sends to David his prophet, now Nathan will rebuke David, and he declares God's judgment upon him, but this is not done just simply to punish David. See, Scripture tells us time and time again that God does not desire the death of the wicked. In Ezekiel 18.32 and Ezekiel 33.11, God declares that he finds no peace in the death of the wicked, but desires that they would repent and turn away from their wickedness and live. God sends Ezekiel to warn the people of Israel, to call them to repentance, so that they would not be destroyed. Again, in 1 Timothy 2, 4, Paul declares that God desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter declares that God is slow in bringing about the second coming because God wishes for no one to perish but allows them a chance to come to repentance. And so God sends forth his messages to rebuke and to declare judgment, not out of hatred or anger, but out of love. 
in Matthew 18, Jesus instructs us to go to those erring brothers and sisters in the church and rebuke them. First, privately, then if they don't repent, we should bring along with us someone to back us up. And if they continue to not repent, then we need to bring them before the whole congregation. And sadly, if they continue to refuse to repent, then they must be excommunicated. Yet, this is never done as some kind of cruel, harsh punishment. But it's done in love to correct them, to bring them to repentance so that they might be restored. Jesus tells us that we need to rebuke the sinning brother so that they would listen to us and we would regain them. Likewise, in 1 Timothy 1.20, when Paul speaks of the excommunication of Hymenaeus and Alexander, he says that this was done so that they would learn to stop blaspheming. The goal is always to fix and correct and restore them, not to simply badger them and punish them. Rebuke. And punishment is not meant to be some sort of vengeance, but restoration. The pastor John Peter Lang, in his commentary on Samuel, called God's rebuke and punishment a means of grace. Now by this, Lang does not mean a literal means of grace, that is, the preaching of the law, you know, somehow bestows on us God's grace. For it is only the preaching of the gospel that is actually a means of grace. Yet the preaching of the law is necessary. It is an often necessary first step that can open the doors to the preaching of the gospel. In John 3, 19-21, Jesus declares that those who live in darkness flee from his light because they are afraid that their sins would be made exposed to the world. Such is the case of King David. He thought that he could hide his sin. But when it was discovered that deceiver Bathsheba was pregnant, David had two options then, confess and seek forgiveness or continue to hide. The natural inclination of man is hiding. We fear judgment. Look at Adam and Eve. After eating the forbidden fruit, they could have run to God and sought his forgiveness, but instead they hid themselves. And when God comes and finds them and rebukes them, they again had the chance to confess, and yet they failed. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed Satan. Neither of them took responsibility for their own actions. Neither of them sought repentance or forgiveness, and thus they were excommunicated from the garden. Likewise, David decided that the best action was to flee this light and hide in the darkness of his sin. The problem is that that doesn't actually remove your sin. You are bound and trapped in your sin, your guilt and the consequences of your actions. You might think you've gotten away with it, but that sin is stuck to you. Wherever you go, it goes with you. And the person who lives in the darkness, they fear the light and so they will suffer the consequences for their sin. The worst part is that the longer you stay in this darkness, the further you shall venture into it, attempting to flee the light. The further you go, then the worse your sin becomes. The little lies become big lies in order to cover your sins more. Look at David. First he commits adultery, then it leads him into murder. If David had just fessed up earlier, things would have been different. Sure, Uriah and Bathsheba would have to deal with the difficult situation of adultery, especially with her now carrying David's son. David would have to deal with the shame of his sin. There may have been a divorce. David, Uriah and Bathsheba may have separated, as was permissible by the law, Mosaic law. Yet, Uriah's life would have been spared and reconciliation still could have been sought between all parties involved. When a person becomes engrossed in his sin, his eyes begin to turn inwards on himself. He begins to self-justify. He defends his actions. Anything and everything he does now seems right in his own eyes. No matter how much others around him suffer, he forgets about them. 
Ultimately, he forgets about God and he becomes focused on his own guilt. The only way to snap a person out of this is to hold a mirror up to them and let them see what they have truly become. The church father, Augustine of Hippo, states that David did not yet admit his iniquity. And so the prophet Nathan grabs the sins from behind David's back and holds them up to his face before his own eyes so that David could see the severity of his actions. See, in Lutheranism we speak of the three uses of the law. The first use is the curb through which God uses to curb our actions, to prevent us from hurting ourselves and hurting others. The third use is the guide through which God instructs us how we shall live a life as good people, and is the second use, the mirror, that shows us our sins so that we would realize we aren't perfect and that we need God's help. This is what Nathan has come to do, to hold the mirror up to David so that David could see how wicked he had become. And so Nathan does that exact thing. And when coming to David, Nathan does two very important practices which help to bring about David's confession. These are great examples of pastoral care and how to deal with an erring brother. Firstly, Nathan speaks with David privately. Scripture shows us that David's sin will become known public. And this, as Nathan says, is part of God's punishment upon David. However, despite that, Nathan still begins to speak to David one-on-one. -on -one. This is a great practice of pastoral care. If Nathan were to rebuke David publicly, David would be publicly shamed. Such shame triggers a person to become defensive. And if a person who is shamed in this way becomes defensive, they tend to try and hide or justify themselves. It therefore becomes difficult for them to ever confess their faults. In Matthew 18, Jesus declares that public shaming is meant to be a last resort for the impenitent. And here, we should always rebuke privately and then only use public shaming once they have continued to ignore us. Yet even then, there are two different ways in which public shaming can take place. There is one way in which an individual just shames someone before a crowd. This form of public shaming is not meant to be done. It only manages to make the individual feel shamed before a mob. This is essentially a form of slander, because it doesn't bring the person to repentance, it only seeks to defame them before others. But in Matthew 18, when Jesus instructs us to publicly shame people, we are to do so in the presence of the church. In this way, it is not meant to be one person shaming another before a crowd, but instead meant to be the crowd working as a group to rebuke their sinner, to rebuke the sinning brother. In the first situation, the rebuker is essentially saying, Hey everyone, look at how bad this person is. Well, in the second situation, the rebuker is saying, all of us together are calling you to repent. Thus, Nathan comes to David one-on-one, -on -one, not publicly, hoping that this may bring David to repentance. And here Nathan does something else that is helpful for pastoral care. In fact, the early church father, Gregory the Great, in his book on pastoral care, says that we should follow Nathan's example using this parable to help diffuse the situation. As Gregor would say, using a similitude to get David, so that David is not aware that he at first is the one being accused. See, Nathan diffuses the situation by telling David of a man who killed his beloved, who killed the beloved lamb of his neighbor. In this story, Nathan speaks of the poor man who loved his sheep. He loved it like it was a daughter. Now it seems strange for a person to love a sheep like this. Nathan is doing this to play on David's emotions, to pull at his heartstrings, to garner his sympathy. The hearer is made to care for this sheep. Thus, we will be outraged when we hear that it is killed. 
And so after David hears this, he is outraged, angers, he condemns the sinful man for killing the sheep. And that is when Nathan rips off the mask and declares to David that you are the man. Many might point out that David didn't kill his neighbor's sheep. He took his wife and killed him instead. Now, we needn't find a one-to-one -one parallel between these two stories. The reality is that David's sin is actually worse than the man in the story. And that's the point. David cares so much about this sheep in this story. He is heartbroken to hear that it is killed. He grieves with the poor man. He is outraged at the rich man. And now David reveals that David is just like the rich man, but even worse. If David feels so enraged about a man killing his neighbor's sheep, then how much more should David be enraged to think about the fact that he stole a man's wife and killed that man? After David has condemned the rich man, Nathan makes it aware that to David that he is the sinner. And here Nathan has trapped David in his own words. David has already spoken his condemnation on the rich man. How could he now defend his own actions? David now has two choices. Be a hypocrite and continue to defend his own actions. Or finally, just give up and repent and seek forgiveness. We read in 1 John for chapter 1 verses 5 to 10 that there are those who walk in the light versus those who walk in the darkness. John describes those in the darkness as those who say they have no sin. He calls them liars. He says the truth is not in them. God's word is not in them. As for those in the light, John describes them not as sinless people but as those who confess their sins and are cleansed from all unrighteousness. See, as I mentioned above, laying called the law a means of grace. And as I said, only the gospel is a means of grace. And so in the most literal sense, the law is not a means of grace, but in a more broad sense, we could say the law is a means of grace in the sense that it brings a person to the place where grace may be found. See, the purpose of the law is not to give you God's grace. It's to bring you to the realization that you need God's grace so that you can now receive it. It is to pull you into the place where you can now receive that grace. Those in the light are those who receive God's grace. When we hide our sins, we are hiding in the darkness. Thus the law is like a net or a chain that is used to wrap around us and drag us into the light. And once we are in the light, we can either bask in the glorious forgiveness of God or we can try and crawl back into the darkness of sin. So Nathan has managed to snare David in a net. He has dragged him into the light. David's sin is now exposed. And David, finally, by the grace of God, confesses his sins, repents, and falls upon the mercy of the Lord. And the Lord forgives David and removes his sins from him. Yes, there is still going to be punishment. David will have to put up with the temporal consequences of his sin. But the eternal consequences are removed. David's soul has been redeemed. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know that this message is not just a message to David, but that it applies to every one of you. It applies to all of us. While we are sitting here, Listening to the story of David, we all think about how bad David is. We think about poor Uriah, that man who had his wife stolen, his family ruined, and then ultimately his life taken from him. How dare David, such a wicked man David is. He should be cast out. 
Yet to you God declares you are the man. Every single one of you, you are the man. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous. Every one of us is guilty of sin. We all seek to defend our own actions. We all seek to self-justify. Therefore, when we read of the account of King David, let us remember that we are the man. We are the sinner. We are the fallen one. We are the one who need to confess our sins and fall upon God's mercy. It is we who need to receive the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, let us then follow the example of David, who once he has received the rebuke of Nathan, confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. As John said in his epistle, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us repent. Let us confess our sins and let us believe that our sins are forgiven because God has declared to each and every one of you, not only are you the sinful man, but God, also declares to you that your sins have been put away and you shall not die. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.